Well, here we are moving into chapter three in our odyssey to understand communication and communication theory. Um, I've mentioned during the uh, time that we were visiting before class that we are getting closer to the time when our examples are going to be on the web CT and that becomes a part of this. I'll begin to mention some of those examples, particularly for people who will use the tape, the DVD uh, set up that we will uh, provide for students over the next number of, uh, of months and years. Um, our, our chapter three introduces us to three uh, theories. The theories relate to language, message, and meaning. I think that that's a nice package. I think that those elements work together. Uh, I want to ask you some questions to sort of tantalize you a little bit into thinking about the centrality in our life of language and how language allows us in a sense then to create messages which then become meaningful. And during this chapter, we're also going to be able to understand how the phenomena of conversation works. Uh, because one of the arguments that will be made by one of the theories that we look at is that meaning is something that evolves through a, an exchange that happens over time. And what's the nature of that exchange? How does it work? Uh, one of the problems of studying communication is that we take so much of communication for granted uh, that we fail to recognize where it is that we then need to look to really understand it. Had I had just a little bit more time at the end of our discussion on Thursday, I would have emphasized some themes that grow out of the study of the anatomy and where we were last week that can also help to preview where we're going. Uh, if you were to look on page 87 and 88, and you don't have to do that, it will be there even when you look. Uh, I try to extract some themes that then preview where we're going. The, the chapter on information will deal with uncertainty. Uncertainty is an important part of understanding communication behavior. And one of the elements of uncertainty is that it is uncomfortable. So one of the themes that we deal with is how do we communicate to reduce this discomfort? And part of it is related to language, meaning, and messages because we have to be able to reduce the uncertainty of how we work through a conversation or how things become shared meaning so that we know that when we're talking about something, someone else has some rough idea of what it is that we're talking about. Uh, people communicate to achieve social influence. You know that I really emphasize the connection between communication and social influence. That communication allows us to be influential to one another and influenced by one another. I would argue that language is very instrumental to that influence, even to the taking on of shared perspectives, the seeing of the world in relatively similar ways, and even understanding people when they see the world in quite different ways than we do. We deal with ourselves as members of groups. Uh, we deal with identity. Identity is an important part of the communication process. We're going to see that also when we talk about language. To what extent do the words that get assigned to us by society in one way or another shape our identity? Are we a product of how other people have communicated with us and what language says about us? Who we are, what we believe, how we are perceived, and all of that sort of thing. And it's also something that is dynamic. Because if we're young, we're often using terms to describe ourselves that are different than we might if we are middle-aged or older, or we're in romantic relationships, we're in family relationships, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, not only are we interested in identity, we're interested in identification. To what extent do we take on words that allow us to see ourselves in varying ways as similar to one another? For instance, we think of ourselves as people at a university, a major university. Uh, you see yourselves as students. You may see yourselves by your year in class. I'm a freshman. I'm a sophomore. And it's even possible that you use that identity to identify with other people. Oh, you're a freshman. Uh, you're not a senior. We're a senior. You're just lowly. I remember a time when you went to college and you had to go through some sort of initiation. 
And one of the initiation rituals at my campus in western Colorado was they gave the freshman men a football and they told them, the athletes did, that if the athletes got the football, we would have to go through initiation for one additional month. Somewhere in Gunnison County, there is a football in a stock tank. If you have any idea what a stock tank is, it's a great big uh, tub uh, that you can put water for animals in. There is a football in there. It is encased in barbed wire, about 30 rolls of barbed wire. And it is uh, concrete. And I have no idea what anyone will ever do if they break into that and find that there's a football in there, but I will guarantee you that the athletes did not get the football from us in our class. So what happens when you have local farm boys as a part of the group of freshmen being initiated? Well, identification becomes a part of who we are. Last year, some of you identified with your high school chums in your little high school, wherever it was, or your big high school. All of a sudden you pack up and you go off to the university and there's a different sense of identity and perhaps a different sense of identification. Who we are, where we are in society, what is our nature, what should we do, what should we not do. A meaning is a product of culture. We talk about that. We're going to get into that more. Relationships count. The media are extensions of people's need for information. Entertainment counts. We are a people that like entertainment. Climates and cultures count in organizations. Climates and cultures have a lot to do with the meaning that we share. How do we know how to go about doing what we do on a university campus? It's because we have shared meaning. What are the rules? What are the regulations? What are the expectations? Uh, what are the roles that we play? What are the titles that we have to learn? And so forth and so forth. Uh, people seek to form useful attitudes. People want to be self-efficacious. We want to be able to make a positive difference on our behalf as we go through life. We become known to others. They become known to us. And how does that occur? Uh, we are, in a sense, what we eat. We are, in a sense, how we communicate. The processes of communication are very much value-laden. And finally, we deal with communication in some sort of a cost-reward basis. Well, one of the reasons that I preview those sort of principles that guide our inquiry into communication is that they may come in one way or another relevant to us as we then explore in chapter 3 what's the nature of language, what's the nature of message and meaning as we try to unwrap that particular process. Um, when we think of then as an overview, the role of language in our communication systems, processes, rules, life, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, we often think of language as the medium of exchange. Language of, is the medium of exchange. By that, I mean that we have to, in one way or another, take on a shared view of the world around us. I think it would be really hard to imagine dealing with people that in one way or another didn't have some sense of the world as you have. In various times we've even referred to people that suffer a different view of the world as having a kind of medical, treatable perhaps, malady meaning that people may suffer from a mental disorder that gives them a view that the world is different from ours, and that becomes problematic. We also know that at various times, uh, despotic regimes will say that if you don't go along with what the despot believes, that you're insane, meaning that we share a view of reality in one way or another, which allows us to go about the business of doing what we do. We have to understand driving, we have to understand driving rules, we have to understand talking, we have to understand all of this sort of thing, meaning that in one way or another we come to see the world in similar ways. Now some of you say, but those ways may differ by culture, they may differ by age, they may differ by generation. And that then brings us into one of the theories that we'll talk about later on. 
Well, we can argue that language is nothing more than a game. It is a conventionalized symbol system. Conventionalized symbol system. Some of you have studied different languages. Some of you are by lingual, some of you are more than bilingual. You speak and write a variety of languages. In a sense, at the most basic level, what is a language? Is it a conventionalized symbol system? If that's the case, what do I mean when I talk about a conventionalized symbol system? It is a kind of knowable, systematic, routine group of squiggles. Is writing squiggles? Is lettering and font squiggles? Is any set of squiggles uniquely better or worse than any other set of squiggles? Not really. It's a game that we play, right? We come into the world, we're sitting by our parents, they open a book, they point to an animal in the book, it may be a cat, and we see then a squiggle that looks like that, we see a squiggle that looks like that, we see a squiggle that looks like that, and after we've seen it a long time, we begin to say, hey, I think I've got this game figured out. And I think that's how children begin to acquire socialization. Hey, I think I've got this game figured out. I think I can play this. And so they then say cat. And oh my gosh, the parents are so excited. We've got a bright child that's going to be a, you know, a, a law graduate from Harvard someday, make a lot of money, going to solve all the problems of neurophysiology and da-da-da-da, uh, you know, all of this kind of stuff. Be a wonderful musician, whatever it might be. There are rewards for learning this conventionalized symbol system. Uh, children, for instance, understand very quickly that they can ask for stuff, water. And we even then, at various times, find it very cute that children will create little words which they use, which are not our words, but we know what they mean. For some reason, I, as a child, and I know that's hard for you to imagine, here I stand up here looking very much unlike a child, called water, golly gaw. I guess it gurgled or something. I have no idea, I have no memory, but I, know that I called it golly gaw. And lo and behold, you see, people in my family would have given me a glass of water if I had said golly gaw. Why, they knew that conventionalized symbol system. It was a set of rules that we could play. And you may remember when we talked about those rules before, we talked about them as being two kinds. One is regulatory rules, the rules that we use to do the game, meaning that Language is a rule-based experience, isn't it? And some of you are painfully reminded of that when you show up in your English class. Grammar is a set of rules. Spelling is a set of rules. All of that sort of stuff is defined by a set of rules. That if you can randomly do and say anything, then the system goes kaput, to use a German term. It doesn't work if we can all do it any way we want to. Now sometimes we play with it, sometimes we have poets that play with it, and we know that every generation reinvents a language which they use for their own identity and their own identification. We know that that also happens by subcultures. So language is an important part of our identity, it's an important part of our system, but it at heart is a conventionalized symbol system. We've agreed to play the game. I talked about regulative rules, rules of the game. Constitutive rules are the rules of interpretation. How do I interpret what's going on? How do I know whether we're fighting or being romantic? I was watching last night, as I said, the last episode of Lover Money. And these people are trying to figure out, does she love me, does she not? Will she accept me, will she not? Should I take a million bucks or should I take her? What if I take a million bucks and she doesn't want me? I don't know. I mean, all of this kind of stuff, we're dealing with uncertainty, aren't we? We're trying to manage it. We're trying to deal with it through conversation. We're trying to figure out where we are. What's going on? What's the deal? How am I winning? How am I losing? What's happening? Why? Because we'll see over and over again, we don't like uncertainty, and language is one of the ways to deal with the management of uncertainty. You go into a restaurant, there are menus. We know the names of the dishes that are prepared. We know the difference between a hamburger and lasagna and salad so that we can use the appropriate word. And then sometimes when we go in constitutive, we now realize what kind of a restaurant it is. I suspect, for instance, that the better restaurants in town if you walked in and said, I'll have a number two, 
It just wouldn't make sense, would it? But you go into Wendy's and say, I'll have a number two, and they've got it all broken down, because that's easy then to translate into a screen, which some of you had your days in hell, operating down at your local Burger King or Wendy's and all of this. Why? Because we have people out there that have to be trained to make a, 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 a machine work for them, and accountants are driving our life. Well, okay, so we've got conventionalized symbol systems. One of the questions that I asked when I was a sophomore, I didn't ask many questions when I was a freshman. I was afraid that people would find out I was stupid. So I went around feeling enormously arrogant and I knew everything. Then when I was a sophomore, I began to question everything. One of the questions that we asked, and probably sophomores do that routinely across the world, to what extent can we think without language? To what extent can we think without language? Now, it's very hard for us to imagine that because we're busily thinking in terms of language. But we also can imagine that children somehow can figure out something before they have language. They can sort this out. Children know differences of light and dark. They know differences of warm and cold. They know differences of feel good, feel bad. They know differences of hunger and, and being satiated. Uh, they know differences. Now that's a starting point for language. Language assumes that the world is broken into differential stimuli or differentiatable stimuli. And that's something for us to stop and imagine, isn't it? The whole world being different. Tiles are different from tables which are different from, uh, from teepees. And the tiles on the floor may be different than the tiles in the ceiling. So what we have is a world where we can see stuff that is different. We can experience stuff that is different. And the question is then, to what extent, when we give names to those different things, does it give us a kind of command over those things? And is that then the incentive to have a language and to learn a language and to become a part of that language culture because we know how to manage our life to be a part of social influence, etc., etc. So can we think, certainly can we think in relatively sophisticated ways independent of language? Any takers on that? All right, yeah. Yeah. And I think most of them are probably but there are most of people out there who are still working at the sort of symbol, sensory perception level. Well, even people that can do very intellectual on another level. Ah, okay. Those who work on that level, they're usually the same. Even level. imagine stuff that is an extension of what they know and think. Yeah. Yeah. We know Helen Keller, whose name now apparently is unfamiliar to the vast majority of Americans. Helen Keller was born blind. She was born deaf. Imagine a child coming in the world. They cannot hear sound and they cannot see the world around them. Helen Keller in her biography said that the most amazing day of her life was when she had her hands under a pump of water and she knew that that which was washing over her hands, which she could feel but she could not see and could not hear, when she knew that it had a name. It had a name. Before that time, and I think she was maybe eight, she had lived in a world of chaos, she had lived in a world of stimulus and response that could not be given order by this shared language, right? So people can probably think, but think in relatively primitive, narrow, and we could even go so far if we're careful in thinking of unsocial ways, meaning that we don't know what the rules and game is of the larger population that we're working in. And I'm sure that, you know, like maybe somebody that lives out on a farm or lives in nature <laughs> would be more likely to, um, you know, have have that kind of um, sensory, um, you know, more so than somebody that lives in the city and is constantly bombarded with radio and TV and 
school and thought it might be and, uh, one of the arguments that we find pretty compelling is that every culture creates a language unique to their own survival system Eskimos for instance have hundreds of words about snow in Houston we only need one it's the white stuff on the ground sometimes but not for very long but if we're Eskimos, it may be that we need to know all of the conditions of snows and type of snow because our very survival may depend upon us being able to understand that. I have heard that Bedouin languages will have many, many terms for camel because they're so enormously dependent. And instead of using an adjective like pregnant camel, they simply have another word for camel. And when you mention something like farmer, I know all kinds of vocabulary of farm stuff, uh, which you probably as urban types wouldn't know. You have no idea of the difference between a steer and a barrow and a sow and a gilt and a, you know, all of these things. But we did out there because it was a part of our, our livelihood. So you take my uncle, who just recently passed away almost at age 90, and you put him on the farm, he understands all of that stuff, but you bring him to town, town scares the bejesus out of him. He doesn't understand town, does he? Because the argument is that in large part we create and use words to manage the environment in which we find ourselves. But then there are those thinkers that can think well beyond the level of where we are, but probably even that is an extension. Certainly in terms of communicating with someone, it's got to be an extension of what we know. Einstein can't go so far that he can think things that are useful to other people if he then cannot find those shared conventionalized symbol systems to talk about it in ways that become meaningful, right? Okay? So, a little bit of that. And what I'm trying to do is to impress upon you what's important about language, which we often take so much for granted. It's a means of sharing knowledge. It's a means of sharing knowledge. As you come into the world, you don't know much. And so you sit around trying to sort the world into identifiable stuff. Is it important that you learn very quickly what is edible and what's not edible? Do you pretty quickly begin to understand what is warm and what is cold? Uh, we lived on a, f a farm in western Colorado with a coal stove and it would get very, very hot. And so we would tell my nephew, uh, that's hot and it seemed to baffle him he just didn't get it and then one day he pushes his granddad away my dad saying hot and we figure that in the interim he's gone over with his little chubby baby finger touched that sucker and said I think I've just discovered what hot means <laughs> but we carve the world into this then we begin to realize we've got parents and non-parents we realize that we've got even more importantly grandparents with all that money and all of that time and all of that affection and then they can get tired of us and go home instead of be angry and grumpy and uh, you know all of that sort of thing with us we realize that the world can be broken into manageable shareable units of knowledge knowing that we can do so becomes important to us as well it isn't just that we can do that it is knowing that we can do that we know that words have something to do with stimulus and response. Now it's interesting, I think there's a, a, a nice quotation on page 91. Communication can hardly be treated without reference to the interpretations actors bring to their attempts to symbolically interact. Without attention to the ways in which actors represent and make sense of the phenomenal world, construe event associations, assess and process the actions of others and interpret personal choices in order to initiate appropriate symbolic activity the study of human communication is limited to mechanistic analysis whether you agree with that or not I think that's a part of what we're getting at okay now stimulus and response we're going to see our first theory based upon stimulus and response if I say the word dog something comes to mind in, in all of you probably. It may be that you're thinking of your dog, a dog. I've always been amazed that when I say dog, people think a cat. I guess Freud would have to explain free association in one way or another to us. Uh, why do we think of cat? Why do we think of postman? Why do we think of this, that, and the other thing? Uh, I had a dream last night, and I probably dream all the time, but I, 
I don't remember most of my dreams anymore, but I have a blue dog. So if I were to say a blue dog, some of you would say a blue dog. What in the world is a blue dog? You've got to go out in the country. Everybody in the country has got a blue dog. No one in the city has a blue dog. They're an Australian breed called an Australian Queenslander or, or, or a dingo, or they go by different names. But I guess their real name is Australian Queenslander. Uh, they even go so far as to build that as their culture into their police force down there. Anyway, here or there. My dog, standing by me on the porch, jumped off, as he often does, and then fell 100 feet. Now, he did that twice in my dreams last night. I'm trying to figure this out. I need to call Freud and say, what's going on? But the point I'm making is, even my dream, you can't imagine my dream, but you can imagine something that parallels my dream by knowing something about dog and porch and jump off and fall 100 feet and say, well, how much coffee did he have before he went to bed last night or whatever it might be that was unsettling his stomach. We can account for that. We know what that means as best we can. But if I were to tell you my dog, my blue dog, and I also have a brown and white dog, Without ever having seen them and experiencing them, you take the words like blue and you put that together and you take brown and white and put it together and you imagine based upon something you know and then you look at my dog and then you say, oh, that's what your dog really looks like. Oh, that's what a blue dog really is. Which means that somewhere we have some kind of a connection between what we've experienced, the names of what we've experienced, and then the residue of all of that that lingers in our minds. But when we use a word and we go back to how do we communicate, I say the word up, you know what that means. Something comes to mind that is a reasonably good parallel, down, you know what that means. Across campus, you know what that means. The UC, you know what that means. Meaning that the words that I use stimulate some kind of a thought. Now, we know also that that can be the basis of deception. Because what I use is words that are trying to deceive you, lead you to conclusions different than what the truth might really be. So, it isn't just an easy, straightforward equation. Uh, words as language, I mean as rules-based, Words as culture, we're going to see one theory devoted heavily to this. We call it linguistic relativism. Some of you being bicultural, bilingual, I mean bilingual, know that you often have to live in different cultures depending upon where you are, with whom you are associating. And we can do that very nicely. We talk later on about social identity theory. Sometimes social identity has a lot to do with the languages that we are a part of, the language cultures that we're a part of, the ways in which we see the world. Um, so language can become a part of that part of us as well, part of our culture. Language is terministic screens, meaning is terministic screens. Uh, we'll talk about this when we discuss the theory of Kenneth Burke. Burke believed that words stand between us and reality so that once we've learned the meaning of the words, we can't really see reality independent of what the words tell us reality is. Does that make sense? No, you say that doesn't make a lick of sense. But I hope it does by the time we're done. To what extent, if we think through words and words carry meaning, and part of the meaning is attitudinal even, what we like, what we don't like, say, how does that work? Well, if I say the word grubs, worms, and you come to my house and said, hey, nice to have us in, over for dinner tonight. What are we having for dinner? And I say grubs and worms. Some people would say, that doesn't sound like my kind of thing. I'm going to leave and go home. I went to some friend's house one time. I'm a meat and potatoes guy. I have a diet that has about five items on it, and you get me out of that, and I get real nervous. So I went to some friend's house, and she was French, and I walked into the kitchen to get an adult beverage, and lo and behold, <laughs> there were snail shells in there. And I thought, snails are something you pick off of the wall and put salt on to get rid of. You just do not ingest them. What's worse is that then, knowing that I was getting nervous, the woman there from England said, no, we're not having escargot, as though that's going to convince me that they're not snails. 
She said, we're really going to have kidney pie. Oh, my God. Kidney pie. I wouldn't eat a kidney if I were down to, you know, the last bite that I could ever consume in the world, I suspect. I am a limited omnivore. I eat a very limited number of things. Well, so the whole point is our diets, what we think is right and wrong, what we think is edible and unedible, inedible, may largely have something to do with language may largely have something to do with language. What we see the world as and impose upon the world our culture. And our culture defines what is edible and not edible. So what you're saying is if you had no idea what the snail itself was because you didn't know what it was called and the symbol was, that you might not, not want to eat the snail. I suspect, knowing my wife, that I've eaten things that if I knew what it was, I wouldn't have. Because she is an older sister, and I've never trusted older sisters. But I went one time to the neighbors across the street. She is a South Valley Hispanic, and she served tacos. And I said to her, I said, Esther, as much as I think you're a good cook, this is, I really just don't like, and I found out that it was made out of cow's tongue, which as I understand it is a typical way to make tacos in the valley. But it tasted strange to me. Remember, I have a very narrow latitude. It, it tastes strange. I become enormously suspicious. Tongue. Tongue. We don't eat tongue. We give that to the dogs, right? So you see, once I know what it is, then I know how outraged I can really be. Uh, this is one of the stories I love to tell. I really have no fondness for certain kinds of southern vegetables and I ended up marrying a southern woman. I think that okra and eggplant, for instance, no matter what you call it and how you fool around with it, is still disgusting stuff. When I was newly married, and see this is why words define in a sense who we are, newly married. I am this little husband that just wants to please this little woman so much. She makes eggplant parmesan, which I thought was the worst stuff I had ever eaten but she is my new little bride, right? So I am eating this, and then finally after about four days, because one of the problems with new brides is they ne don't necessarily know how much to fix. They've not done a lot of cooking necessarily. So she fixed a lot, the whole recipe, which would have fed a family of 40. <laughs> and so about the fourth or fifth day in, I say to her, I said, you know, if, if it would be okay... Uh, I would rather not eat this anymore, particularly since you have quit eating it. And she said, I didn't like it at the first, but I thought you did because you kept eating it. Right? And I then eventually, over the years, confessed to her I wouldn't have eaten it in the first place if it hadn't been for being newlywed because eggplant to me is a very, 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 you know, that's on that far end of a mushy, yucky kind of vegetable. I like vegetables on the more firm, crisp side. I like beans. I like potatoes. Even like mashed potatoes, right? Well, anyway, you know, we, and, and, and my guess is that if you go back and see what I eat as a boy, right, how much of what I eat as a boy is what I would eat now as a man. Now, my daughter and my wife, uh, they're much more adventuresome. We went to New England uh, some years ago, and there wasn't, I mean, the lobster population up there dropped dramatically, and those that hadn't been caught just fled. My daughter and wife were eating every lobster they could get close to, every meal of the day. And there I was over in my corner with my hamburger all by myself thinking of a lobster as a great big cockroach with claws, you know. I mean, this most disgusting looking animal in the world. Well, how much of that is where I come from, who I am, what I've experienced? Well, I think in some way or another, deterministic screens help us to understand that. A meaning as response, meaning as the residue of our experiences, what we've encountered, if I've had good eggplant parmesan, is that different than having bad eggplant parmesan? Not much, probably. Uh, meaning as the relationship between words and things, meaning as the relationship between one another, our relationship with one another, to what extent is that meaning driven? Roles and so forth. Dramatic enactment, to what extent is life an undirected play? 
To what extent is life an undirected play? Do you have any idea of that? We come into the world, is there a drama going on in society that we learn to play that drama? There are scripts. Is language script based? Scripts meaning that what you do is you sit in front of things. One of the examples that I've got for you to see, and I'm sure that most of you and all of you undoubtedly have seen it, is a segment of Sesame Street. To what extent is Sesame Street nothing more than a language slash culture learning technique? Is that what Sesame Street is? Children learn words and they learn culture. What do these words mean and how do these words define how we act toward one another? Can I have a temper tantrum? If I do, I get thrown in a trash can, right? Isn't that where, was it, which one ended up in the trash can? Oscar ended up in the trash can because he always had a temper tantrum. So we can't have temper tantrums, can we? Or we're going to end up in the trash can. So there are rules to our dramatic enactment. To what extent do I interpret what you say based upon what I think you mean and or why I think you're saying it? If you say, I love you, do I try to figure out what your purpose is in saying that as a way in which I interpret what you mean by having said that? Well, let me give you a more real example to students' life. At some point in the semester, imagine this. Student comes into my office and says, Dr. Eath, I really enjoy your class. Your class is my favorite class. Now, how do I interpret that statement? Purpose, right? What's the student's purpose? Do I then wait to see what the rest of this is and I'm not going to be able to take the final examination on that day and my paper is going to be late and all of these other excuses that I've developed, right? Do I, having taught now for so long I can't even count the years, imagine when students engage in ingratiation that there's a larger motive that I have to figure out. Well, dating behavior is the same stuff, isn't it? To what extent do I need to know the purpose? If I say, when will dinner be ready, is that a request for information? At what time? Or when will dinner be ready, meaning I don't hear the skillet rattling out there. Uh, is, is, are we going to feed me within you know, a definable period of time? Otherwise, I'm going to just wither away because I'm still only four years old, and despite my appearance. I'm just a little hungry boy standing around in the kitchen waiting for food. Or can I graze? Can I begin to eat anything that I get my hands on? I mean, that's the other side of that, isn't it? So we're trying to figure this out. Purpose, the attributed purpose. Why do people say what they say and how does that affect our understanding? Uh, you bet. What about the idea that um you know, that our word-based um, culture, you know, that language is, is limiting and that, um, you know, that there's so much that there aren't words to describe. And also the fact that, like in, just for example, like in romantic relationships where there's uh, maybe sexual tension under the surface that doesn't Maybe happen. it's not under the surface. Well, that's true. You bet. Uh, but, uh, we get into all kinds of nonverbal things. Um, the purpose of a touch, for instance, right? When we talk later on about interpersonal communication, we may talk about intimacy trials. Intimacy trials. If I move closer, if I begin to touch and I haven't begun to touch, how is that interpreted? How is that responded to? Is it a welcomed uh, intimacy attempt or is it an unwelcomed intimacy attempt? We even get into policy issues when we go down the line. But it is something that is interpretable on both sides. And so same is true of a joke. If I can say something that I think is a jest, it may not be a jest if you take it 
appropriately, if you take it in a way that I didn't want it, I might say, you know what we ought to do? <laughs> we ought to get married. And you say, on your worst day, on your best day, in your dreams, any number of things, I say, well, it was just a joke. It was just a joke. <laughs> when you were talking about, uh, talking about scripted language, some people are much more scripted in what they say you than bet. others. A lot of people just sort of say whatever comes to mind, and they, they see that as being authentic when... It can be seen as authentic, and we like to think that communication is better when it's immediate and transparent, not filtered too much, not planned too much, right? Last night, one of the people in Love or Money was wearing his heart on his sleeve. He was willing to tell her everything. She wasn't willing to tell him much. Why? Because she really liked the other guy. Did this guy... See, I'd love to have some kind of wiring mechanism to see how these are interpreting all of these plays. Then I could put that on your, the website as well. Because I think there's a lot going on up there that we're trying to figure out and so forth. Yes, push the button. I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Okay. I can speak from experience that if you don't have scripts, you end up looking like a total idiot. You can. You can also, if you have the wrong script at the wrong time, I'm probably the second or third worst social animal in the world. I'm one of those unfortunate people that can pick the absolutely inappropriate script at the most inappropriate time, thinking I'm being cute and bringing a conversation to a complete... Stopping. We are total lost twins because I've asked like so many people if they're <laughs> pregnant and they're just fat. So yes. <laughs> oh, all kinds of stuff. Yes. You know, if people don't send me a Christmas card, and this is another issue of rules-based communication, right? Christmas card two years in a row, I take them off the list. But you know, there are times when you'd like to say, "Where are you? Are you still alive? Are you well? You know, did you divorced? You begin to make all these attributions about people out there, right? There is uncertainty that we sometimes do not want to know the answer to. But this notion of scriptedness and what are the scripts? Then there are the other people in the world that are wonderfully social. I have a good friend that is this absolute font of questions. She just asks all kinds of questions and people just adore her because she's always asking questions about them. Well, what do you do? And da 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 When I ask the same questions, I sound like I'm down at the HPD interrogating people. <laughs> and people become enormously defensive. And Barbara is looked upon as being wonderfully warm and charming, right? I don't get it. I just go and sit in the corner by myself. And don't talk to anybody for fear that I will say just endlessly stupid things, you know. <laughs> well, it's one reason why at least we try to understand these things. Or there is an argument in interpersonal communication as well as the other forms that we can actually help people. First of all, we understand. We know what the patterns are. And then remember what I talked about in terms of trying to achieve control. Control can be communicating in ways that are more likely to maximize the reward rather than minimize the, the reward. And then I would say that some of us are trainable and others of us are hopeless. And I think I'm in the hopeless category, right? Because I don't think I ever uh, get better at it. A rules in use, meaning as rules in use, as we engage with one another, what are those rules in use? One of the things that I first learned, but I knew it when I got there because I was a farm boy from western Colorado, is that when you move out to Round Top, Texas, Carmine, Texas, people show up, you got to visit. You got to visit. Come in, sit down. How you doing? Fine. You? Fine. Good weather. You bet. Terrible weather. Why not? Going to rain. Could be. Da, da, da. Two hours later, we haven't learned a lot, but we've engaged in this ritual, right? We have to pay our dues. You have to stop and visit with people. If you say, I'm sorry, I don't have time for you, they'll say, go back to Houston. We didn't want you here in the first place. <laughs> Conversation is a part of the cost of being in the community. Okay, I'm from the country, too, and you used to, like, do the finger wave when well, you're I'm driving? On the steering wheel. See, my problem is my wife does that, but that's Texas, see? <laughs> And, and from Colorado, I'm a guy like this. See, I go like this. And probably people on the other end say, he's obviously not from here. How much of our nonverbal allows us to know whether people are insiders and outsiders? Uh, that's one of the reasons we use nonverbal, because the subtleties of knowing whatever it is, we distinguish ourselves. But you're right. It's this one finger, which I think looks dopey, right? <laughs> then I've got this big German 
fourth generation German farmer that goes around the road like this. But that's because he's a wise guy, you know, <laughs> waving all these, you know. Right. But that's, he's one of the local characters. And every community's got local characters, right? Uh, the other part of it is, I know from Western Colorado, my family got there in 1880, and all these people from California, Texas that moved in recently, they don't realize that they're never going to be a part of the community. I heard a guy the other day that said he'd lived in Vermont for 40 years, and if he'd lived there for 360 more years, they would have taken him as a local. That if you didn't get there 400 years ago, you're an outsider. Same thing is true for Carmine. If you weren't there four generations ago, you're always going to be an outsider. There's nothing you can do. You can know the locals, but there's a subculture, there's conversation going on that you don't know what's going on. You, you are an outsider. Uh, my, my neighbor friend, one day after lunch, went outside and he looked out into the field. And, and men do that. You know. We talk by looking out into nothing. And he said, you know, I've discovered something, and I'm waiting to see what he's discovered, partly because he's a character. But, you know, when people say that, then you, they've got what we call the, the demand ticket. They've got the floor. And it would be okay to say what, but it's best to just say, you've got the floor, you keep talking. And he said, I've discovered there are two kinds of people. <laughs> what does this mean? Uh, there are Houstonians, and Houstonians are looked upon in Carmine like Texans are looked on in Hotchkiss, Colorado, right? You're an outsider and an unwelcome type, more likely than not. We'll take your money but we won't take anything else, like advice. We were running ourselves long before you got here. If you don't like the way things are here, you know that's why they have reverse on a transmission, so you can back up and get the hell out of here, right? So anyway, I said, uh, uh, well, yeah, what? And he said, Houstonians that were raised on a farm and those that weren't, and I think I'm on that end. I think I just got adopted and I'm only 200 years late from being a local, right? But at least I'm not an outsider from Houston anymore, just that alone. Well, I've made inroads because you carry some of that culture with you, right? So anyway, in a sense, there we are, all of these things. Well, first theory. It's taken us a long time to get here, but we can at least open the door and begin to say, What's this first theory all about? Representationalism, referentialism. I've mentioned to you before that I think there are some people whose names you should at least be marginally familiar with. Uh, there are two here. One is a fellow by the name of, of I.A. Richards and another one by the name of, of Ogden. And one is a psychologist and one is a linguist uh, English faculty member. Richards was the English faculty member. Ogden was a psychologist. And they worked together to create uh, the theory called referentialism or representationalism. And the theory, in a nutshell, boils down to this, that if we want to know what words mean, we can point to our experiences as evidence of what a word means. For instance, if I want to know what the word cat means, I look at a cat. If I want to know what the word snow means, I look at snow. Something that's cold, something that's white, etc. Now, that also ties into how we have children learning communication. There we've got the children's book, and the book may be full of farm animals or farm things right? And so each of the thing in this book has a different letter associated with it and a different word. A is for apple, B is for bull, C is for cow, D is for dog, donkey, whatever it might be. We begin early on to know that names, ha things have names. Names have things. And children love that, don't they? When children realize that names have things, they, I think, get a sense that this really gives them some degree of power. Because then they can name things, uh, and they can talk about things, and they can get things. 
Uh, they know cookie real early on. They know ice cream really early on. That's pretty good stuff. Uh, my nephew thinks ketchup is probably the best food in the world to him. It's the entire food group. And some of you have experienced this with children. Uh, he will set sucking the ketchup off of his french fries and saying french fries are really pretty bad but I love ketchup, right? Well, what he's doing is defining the world around him by name and that gives him this sense of power. He can ask for things, he can call things, then what happens also is you can learn fairly early on that names can be used as fight mechanisms. You can call people names. Well, I had two nephews that called their younger sister baby. Some of you may say that sounds familiar to my family, baby. And they could say it in such an ugly way. Now, that baby is now six foot one, quite a good athlete, soccer player. And my guess is that Chad and Art every once in a while call her baby, but probably not quite the way they used to for fear that she will reach over and hit them and both of them are actually a bit taller than she is, but I think she can fight back in ways that she couldn't when she was a baby. So we learn early on that words can be used, and it's interesting to me when people say, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words shall never hurt me. Where is that idiot that said that? What can we do to say, you know, you really got it wrong, because sometimes words hurt us in ways that sticks and stones can never hurt because what we do then is to use the word to label somebody with a term that we know that is an insult or a fight term or whatever it might be. But we look into the world around us, we see objects, this differentiated experience, and then we begin to realize that things have meaning. Well, to express their theory, they used a model they called it the triangle of meaning. It's in the book, and we're sooner or later going to have it up here on the screen. Their argument is that meaning has essentially three components to it. One is this experience. I talked earlier about my nephew not knowing what the word hot meant until he touched the hot stove. He had to experience hot. Now, one of the things that makes us different is the different experiences that we have gone through. One of the reasons we have age communication differences is that I've experienced stuff that you haven't. I experienced stuff in a way different what you experienced. Uh, I had parents that went through the depression, people like that, they see wealth and well-being in quite a different way than we would today. I find it amazing, young people getting married and leaving the university, getting a job and saying, uh, we're settling for a fairly modest house, only 3,400 square feet. And I'm saying, modest, 3,400 square feet? Yes, we'll get a bigger house someday. Uh, their grandparents probably had a house in the Heights at 600 square feet and thought it was altogether large enough. But we say, what's a large enough house? How do we define all of this kind of stuff? So some of it is simply based upon our experience. The thought or the residue of the experience, how much stuff do we pack in our brain? We have to get it into our brain. I had a good friend who was a world-class physiologist who says that when the brain is, you know, the brain of an infant is, is almost an undifferentiated mass of, of material. And then as that child experiences stuff, the brain begins to work its way into pathways that become differentiated. And I heard a thing the other day on memory. They are now able to use an MRI device and they can tell you how you think by where your brain at various times thinks about things as you are trying to recall stuff. We know that people who have had brain injuries of one kind or another can lose the ability to recall or lose the ability to associate and it's largely because the pathways are now interrupted or segments are now inactive or non-existent. So the mind is a place where all of this residue gets hooked together in one way or another, in a sort of very much electronic, physiological sort of way. 
And then the last part of this is the symbol of experience, meaning that I and you share a word for this. This summer, our daughter got really interested in watching the two-year-old try to do what the four-year-old was doing. And the two-year-old became fascinated at the prospect of being able to climb up a slide. Now, I don't know how many of you remember as a child what a wonderful accomplishment it was when you first climbed up the slide. There you were. What a big shot you were. Why? Because bigger kids had done that and the rights of being big is to be able to do that. So my grandson, nearly four, goes up the slide and here is the little girl. We've got pictures of her. I climb. I climb. She spent the whole summer and then one day she got to the top. It was like Mount Everest. I big. I big. Right there she was. She was queen of the slide. What a sense of pride she must have had. I big. She is the most incredibly determined human being. If there were anyone I wanted ever in my mind to challenge to do something, I would get Olivia, who I think will, I don't know what she'll accomplish in life, but if you want a mountain move, call her because that kid will stay at it until she gets it done. Well, the notion is that she knew that there were words for climb and she knew that there were words for big and the fact that she would then announce that as a way of self-reference said, you see, I share these symbols with you. I know what's going on. Well, let's look at the triangle of meaning. The thought or reference is what we store in our mind. And therein lies the notion of the name of this theory, referential theory. Referential theory means that words stand in reference to things. So that if we want to know what a word means, we look at the thing. What is a carrot? A carrot is that. What is a cow? A cow is that. What is a table? A table is that. What is a Ferrari? A Ferrari is that. We can point to the thing which is a differential sensory perception and we know what it is by our experience of it and what its name is. The symbol is the word dog, milk chocolate, ice cream, test, graduation, graduate. All of these are words that we knew. They refer to various sorts of things. And then the referent. The referent is the thing that it stands for. The referent is the thing that it stands for. I always find it interesting when I go to graduation that here we have students that have struggled for some period of time. They have paid a fair amount of money. They have memorized all kinds of stuff. They've gone along with the game. And then they get to dress up in really funny ways. Uh, they get to wear this garb. They have to put on this silly hat with this thing hanging down in their face, which is supposed to keep the flies off. And they walk along, and some of them are very solemn, and others of them are really giddy. And then when they get the announcement, da 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 the name is called out. Then members of the family cheer. Father sighs a great leaf, a sigh of relief, you know, and so forth down the line. It is a rite of passage. Last year, I couldn't spell graduate. This year, I are one. I can now assign to me these terms. This is it. And having gone through that then becomes an experience, doesn't it? Well, what did you do? How did you feel when you graduated? You see what I'm getting at? And then that's one of the things then that makes life kind of interesting on the other end. No matter how much men may empathize, and we know that men have sympathy reactions to their wives, girlfriends, maybe even other people around them, pregnancy, but they are never pregnant, I guess. If you hear of a case, I'd like to interview that person. It would be really interesting to know what their reaction was. They can have any kind of reaction in the world, but they never are pregnant. So then you see, as we go through our life, does the word pregnancy mean something different for a woman than a man? Because experiences may be different. Experiences may be different. How we are treated then becomes a way in which we assign meaning to that particular term. But the theme of the referential theory is that reality 
tends to be the way in which we understand what's going on. Now, having used that theory for a number of years, a researcher, and this is where you can kind of get really confused because you just said he mentioned a guy by the name of Ogden. Now he's going to mention a person by the name of Osgood. Osgood, Susie, and Tannenbaum were researchers at the University of Illinois that set out to measure meaning. Set out to measure meaning. They were people interested in knowing whether they could quantify meaning. So one of the ways that they did that was to create what I have in front of you up here, maybe, it'll be up, called a somatic differential. If it doesn't come up, I can point to the page in the book where there is a somatic differential, page 102. 102. Now the notion is that a somatic differential captures the nature of meaning because it allows people to position their thoughts about something on essentially two dimensions. This gets tricky. It's very straightforward, but by my explanation and other differences of hearing and processing, it can be confusing. There are two dimensions to meaning because of what Osgood and his research associates called somatic space. Somatic space. One of these dimensions is the characteristics of meaning. The characteristics of meaning, meaning the attributes. In the book, I talk about if you wanted to do market analysis of a breakfast cereal, you might go and let people experience the breakfast cereal because part of what you want to do is to find out, in a sense, what that cereal means to your consumer audience. Is that a fair way of looking at advertising public relations research? So I let them taste the cereal and then I have them mark somewhere at their discretion within a semantic differential what their reaction was. And the semantic differential has these blanks between the colons, if you can see it, and, and if not in the book. Tasty on one end and tasteless on the other end. If we go out and we sample with our research a thousand people and 998 of them mark this as a tasteless cereal, is that good news for our marketing plan? No, we would want them to all mark taste, tasty tasteful, tasty. We want it to be tasty. Pleasant versus unpleasant. Now I'm reminded of okra. Nutritious versus unnutritious. Uh, people often say that which is the most nutritious can often be the less pleasant tasting. Well, we don't like that. Put enough ketchup and syrup on it and you can eat almost anything except for okra and squash and, well, anyway, nutritious. We would want our consuming customers out there to mark high on the tasty end, high on the pleasant end, high on the nutritious end, high on the attractive end, and high on the fun end. And cereal has to be fun, right? Marketing has told us now over the last number of years, if you can't look at your cereal, play with your cereal, have fun with your cereal, it's got to be different colors. Uh, my wife and I, Grandparents are terrible. I warn some of you out there, you know, send the grandparents away for a long period of time. They will do nothing useful for the raising of children. There is a kind of cereal out there, I think it's called mud and bugs. Mud and bugs? I thought it looked pretty nifty. Unfortunately for my grandchildren, my wife, because it's got a lot of chocolate in it. I like chocolate, right? So my wife looks at the back of it and it's nothing but sugar. Nope, can't do that. Can't feed these children sugar. My daughter, nope, they're not going to eat all of this sugar. And I'm saying, well, they won't have any fun at all. Isn't life, you know, giving yourself all kinds of stuff that you enjoy despite the fact that some of it's not good for you? Well, fun becomes a part of this sort of thing. I guess even at the better end restaurants, we see it as fun. Certainly down at our friends, the fast food folks, they have happy meals. They give us little stuff here and there, 
which we can enjoy as a part of our meal. Well, the notion is food may need to be fun. Well, so we've talked about food. What about grandmother? What's the meaning of grandmother? Has grandmother got gray hair as opposed to not gray hair? Is grandmother old as opposed to not old? Does grandmother bake cookies as opposed to not baking cookies? Does grandmother always have a twinkle in her eye? She's the one that you can always call and tell no matter what your troubles are. She will like you. Is that what grandmother is, you see? The notion is that meaning then has several components to it. It has two major dimensions. One is the items that are associated with that meaning. Ice cream typically is not orange. Carrots typically are orange. So there's an attribute that we would associate with carrots. We can even look at them and say, is that orange enough? And we know that marketers sometimes add dyes to almost everything to make it look better than it would if it were just natural. Because they know that we like the looks of certain things and we're willing to consume a variety of dyes just to make food look better. So, where are we? What is meaning? Meaning is this business within these polar dimensions. Positive, negative, usually. Tasty, tasteless. Warm, cold, whatever it might be. Is grandmother warm? Is grandmother cold? We begin to divide the world up then so that we realize that the word cow or cat or dog or pig or whatever it might be, cookie, and all of these words then have multiple dimensions so that we can even distinguish between different things. There are different kinds of cookies. And some of them are very light and some of them are very dark cookies. Some of them have filling, some of them do not. Some of them have chocolate chips in them, some do not. Some have raisins in, some do not. And so our meaning and our preferences and what we say and what we know is in one way or another shaped by this residue that we carry around called meaning. And meaning can be measured by using semantic differentials. As we go into a political year, we're going to find people saying, is George Bush a strong leader or is he a willy-nilly wimp? Uh, is he just one great big uh, hot bag of air or bag of hot air or is he really a dynamic leader? Well, we're going to want to know that because the ways in which we see the world out there, the meaning that we ascribe to it, is going to influence our voting behavior. It's going to influence a lot of other things that we do. And one of the reasons we say that is because words not only have meaning, but part of that meaning is informative, what is the world, but carrying with that is the notion of what my attitudes are toward that world that I see. What are my attitudes? Attitudes, simply stated, we'll get more into attitudes as we go along, are positives and negatives. Is positives and negatives. We go to Baskin Robbins, we look in there, we see all of the various flavors of ice cream. Which ones are our preferences? By name, we knew we can order that shared symbol so that somebody on the other side knows what to give us. We've got a symbol system that will work for us to manage meaning, manage what's going on, because we know the deal. Referential, in a word, is the theory that argues that if we want to know how words mean or what words mean, we ask ourselves, what do words refer to? And it is that which they refer to that constitutes the meaning. The experience that we have that has a name that we then look at and say, that's what the meaning of that word is. Referential. Let me stop at this point. I want to lead into our next theory because it's a good point of contrast. But let me just see if you have any questions about what I've talked about. If I were, and this is a possibility, some of you may have already seen it in your review list. What if I were to say, define referential theory of meaning? Could I do something like that? Would I do something like that? Would that be likely? Would it be in your best interest to assume that I might do something like that? You betcha. So if that were the case today, what would you think? What questions would you have? Yeah, poke your button. You bet. One is the list of items, right? The list of items, characteristics. The other one is the polarity. 
the polarity. Okay? Good question. Other questions? Now, leading into linguistic relativity. Just a very brief intro because it's good to preview sort of where we've been and where we're going. Kenneth Burke, another name that you should know. I wrote a book on Kenneth Burke. I did my dissertation on Kenneth Burke. I think Kenneth Burke is a nifty guy. He's the guy at the beginning of the semester I mentioned said that we are the symbol misusing, symbol using animal, that we can do great things with symbols, we can do terrible things with symbols. Kenneth Burke was very much influenced by I.A. Richards. He also realized because he was very political in his thinking, he was a left-leaning type, he was very much convinced that words impose deterministic screens on reality. So that instead of looking at reality to know what words mean, we want to know what reality means by looking at words. By being left-leaning, he would have a different definition of what labor and laborer would have meant writing in the 20s and 30s than would the great industrial barons that thought labor was some sort of stupid being that just devoted its life to the prosperity of someone else. Thousands of men, women, have lost their lives in doing industrial work in the United States. Are they to get our sympathy or are they just the relics, the wreckage of an industrial monster making certain people wealthy? It's that kind of question that led Burke to say how we define things can be very important in how we act toward them. How we define things means how we act toward them. Therefore, according to Richards, if we wanted to know what a woman is, we would point to a woman having certain physical characteristics, certain genetic traits, certain biological capacities, and we would say, that is a woman. But if we went around the world and we asked, what is a woman of somebody who belongs to the National Organization of Women, ask somebody who was a very conservative Muslim, maybe members of the Taliban, if we were to go back in history and ask people like George Washington, what is a woman, uh, would we get different senses of what woman meant and what woman is allowed to do and not allowed to do? One of the things that was interesting is that George Washington, first president of the United States, fairly robust guy, was traveling and met a woman that he had known a bit about but not a great deal. Her name was, was Custis. Mrs. Custis had been married to one of the wealthiest men in the United States, and Mrs. Custis had lost her husband. He died, making her a very wealthy woman. But if someone wanted to take her property and she wanted to sue to keep her property, could Mrs. Custis, a wealthy woman in Virginia, do that? Could she go into a courthouse? Should she protect herself? Or did she need a man? who had a different status of law than she did. We get into issues of race, we get into the issues of condition, preferences and so forth, and we begin to understand the attitudinizing element of language, and that's what Burke is wanting us to think about. So we will pick that up and go further with that on Thursday. Thank you.